Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another podcast with an accent. I'm your host, Vaden Gillick, and today I have with me Chad Logan. He was once a hopeless heroin addict who in 2011 made a traumatic transformation in his life. He decided to get help and was finally able to get sober. Over the next several years, he learned how to help others that were just like himself and eventually started a nonprofit serving those who struggle with any kind of addiction. In the past two years, his organization has been able to help hundreds to find freedom from addiction and who are now living purposeful lives. Chad, yeah. welcome. Thank you so much for having me here. Absolutely. Let's jump to it. What is your accent? Yeah, so I would say um, my accent, my why really is um, to reach people with this life-saving good news, this gospel that, that was reached, that I was reached with, and uh, seeing them uh, grown up, you know, in their faith, and, um, and then seeing them sent out on mission. And, you know, my people are the outsiders, the people of the world that uh, the world is ejected because of a addiction or a compulsion or a codependency or even their families, the people that just need a second chance. We affectionately call these people the wild ones because they take, uh, they take a bit of a different path than most people, but we know that when they get their lives together and when they get a little bit of hope inside of them and God gets a hold of them, they do crazy, awesome things and they reach the world and they start recovery centers and, and counseling centers and, and ministries and nonprofits. And, uh, and so it's really cool to, to be considered one of the wild ones. And my, my accent is, I, I speak wild one, man. I'm, I'm, <laughs> you know, I was one and I still am one. Um, just have changed my life a little bit and the things that I'm wild about are a little bit different now uh, but still wild at heart <laughs> wild one we haven't had a wild one yet <laughs> yeah <laughs> first time for everything <laughs> uh, what's your story what got you yeah. to be speaking the wild accent yeah yeah so um, just kind of a 30,000 foot view of my story I um I was born into kind of a broken home. Dad went to prison shortly after I was born and uh, he was in prison until I was four or five. And then my mom and him tried to stay together for a couple of years and, and that didn't work out. And, um, and so my dad was gone. And I remember at a young age, what does every boy want? He wants for his father to love him and he wants for his father to, um, you know, want that relationship with him. And I remember it at a young age thinking, uh, why doesn't my dad like me? Why doesn't he want a relationship with me? And, you know, I remember times, you know, after my mom and him got divorced where, um, he would uh, say he was going to pick me up. This is back before cell phones. And he said he was going to pick me up and it'd be 4.30 and 5.30 and then 6 o'clock. And finally, I'd go in and, and call his home phone and say, oh, I forgot. Forgot to pick you up. So at a young age, I, I got the idea in my head that I wasn't worth much. And, um, and then my mom got married to a man who was um, – an alcoholic, as was my father. Father was an alcoholic. This kind of runs in my family, and uh, he was very abusive to me and my my sister, and uh, physically and emotionally. Um, and so now I've got this other male uh, figure in my life that also doesn't give me the type of love that I need. And so I was raised in church. I tell people that I was drugged as a child. I was drugged to church every Sunday. And, um, and so I was raised in the church and um, I was in a youth group and there was uh, one of the male volunteers had taken an interest in me and um, come to find out later that he was preying on me. He was a pedophile and he started abusing me up into my early teenage years. So if you look back now, I've got a father who doesn't want anything to do with me. I've got a stepfather who wants to beat me and you know, uh, abuse me emotionally. And I've got this other male uh, figure in my life that's supposed to be you know, godly and part of the church. And he's taking advantage of me. And um, so at a young age, me being, you know, young Chad, six to 15 years old, um, I 
desired a relationship with a man in, in my life that could love me in the way that I desired to be loved by like a father figure. And so what I believe that started at a young age was what I call this God-sized hole. There was a hole inside of me um, that I call a God-sized hole that at a young age, even in elementary school and, and up into high school, I would fill with attention. I was the class clown. I was the one that was always making, you know, the, making the teachers mad and, and uh, making it so the other kids couldn't learn. I was getting in constant trouble and I uh, started being truant from school, started smoking pot and drinking in fifth grade and uh, spent a lot of time in juvenile correctional centers and actually had to go for a year when I was 15 to a correctional boy school. And, uh, and so, but, so it started with the negative and positive attention, but it worked its way into drugs and alcohol in fifth grade, young, young age to be starting that stuff. But I remember when I first uh, smoked my first joint of marijuana, I said, wow, like, this is what I've been looking for. That God-sized hole is filled now. I feel great. And I started drinking, and I was like, this is awesome. And so that, that hole was now filled, what I thought was completely, but really what I was doing was filling it with instant gratification. I was filling it with a pleasure of the world that was always leaving me more and more empty, and it always got harder and harder to fill. So by the time I was in seventh grade, I was uh, using cocaine and uh, started doing prescription drugs. And then fast forward to 20 years old, I was a full-blown heroin addict, um, smoking meth, staying up for weeks at a time, uh, intravenously shooting uh, heroin. And I was suffering. I was really suffering. Um, I had geographically changed my location. Um, I'd been in Phoenix and, and El Paso and all over the place because I kept, I kept looking for that thing that was going to finally make me feel complete, that was going to make me feel whole. And so I tried to fill that hole with drugs, alcohol, new cities, new places, new friends. And so I did that up until I was about 27 years old. So for about 15 years, I filled my life with uh, instant gratification. What's that next thing I can get to give me some pleasure, to give me some joy, whatever it was, uh, you know, fake joy. I don't call it real joy. And so by the time I was 27, um, I was sleeping on my dad's couch and, uh, and, the, and I was in Charleston, South Carolina. Let me tell you how I got here. This was my, my jacked up thinking. I was uh, 20 years old and I told myself, hey, I'm, I'm gonna die if I stay here in Charleston. And I looked at a map and I saw Charleston, South Carolina, and that was the farthest I could get away from where I was at at the time uh, without going into the ocean. And so I picked up everything and I moved to Charleston, but I, I realized though after a while, I couldn't change my geographical uh, location to get away from myself. Myself was what the problem was and how I was living. And so, like I said, when I was 27, I was living on my dad's couch and uh, I just said, man, what am I doing with my life? I've been struggling with drugs and alcohol for 15 years and I'm killing myself. I was at a point in my drug addiction where I was mixing some very dangerous uh, cocktails of drugs every day. And I remember praying to God at that time saying, hey, uh, you know, praying those foxhole prayers. God, just let me wake up in the morning. I just want one more day. I'll get it right tomorrow. And I would always wake up feeling more and more empty, more alone, depression, anxiety, all these things sat in. And, and I finally said, you know, I wasn't suicidal, but I said, I am killing myself. Like I am killing myself. And I, you know, I didn't think I was going to make it much longer. And so I asked for help. Um, I had asked my, my uh, amazing sister for help and she came and uh, when I was finally ready, she got me into a detox center and uh, I had to detox for seven long days off of everything that I was on. Like I said, I was on a dangerous cocktail of drugs and so I detoxed and I had been to detox before many times, um, but this time I said, hey, I'm not just going to get out and and go back right back to the same things because i would go in with a strong resolve saying i'm going to quit everything this time it's going to be different and then i would detox and before i would even get home from the detox center i'd have a case of beer and i'd be looking for crack or something 
And so I realized that this time I had to change something. Um, so I let someone help me get into a four month long term rehabilitation drug rehabilitation center. And when I got in there, um, you know, I instantly started uh, because like I said, I was I was raised in the church, but I remember thinking God was this scary master in the sky um, that just wanted me to follow a bunch of rules and say a lot of really good things on Sunday and show up and serve and give. And he wanted something for me. And I didn't realize he wanted something from me and I didn't realize he wanted something for me. So I knew, I always knew that there was a God. And so I continued to pray throughout those years. But when I got into this recovery center, I really started praying, God, man, if you're there, please show yourself to me, help me to get my life together. And so uh, I, I heard about this great church that some of the other residents were going to on Sunday mornings. And they said the music was really loud and, and uh, it was, you know, it was just a good time. It was like a rock festival, you know, every Sunday. And honestly, the only reason I went was, you know, to get out of the rehab center. And cause I knew there were probably going to be some pretty girls there who hadn't been married yet. And uh, to hear this music they were talking about. But so I attended that, that church in the very first Sunday, I remember it was October 4th, 2011. Um, I started hearing about a God that I don't ever remember hearing about as a kid, a God that um, loved me so much that he sent his one and only son to die for me. And that if I put my faith in him, if I confess that he was Lord, that he was faithful to save me, to save me. And so, um, so I said, Hey, I've tried everything else in the world. I'm going to give this Jesus guy a chance. And, and I really heard the gospel. I heard the good news proclaimed in such a, a beautiful yet simple way that day that I said, Hey, I'm, I'm going to turn away from all this stuff for good as best as I know how I'm going to put this man named Jesus at the forefront of my life. I don't have all the answers. I really don't even know what I'm doing or what I'm saying, uh, but I'm going to give this thing a chance and I'm going to live the rest of my life the best I know for how, how for him. And instantly I started changing. Like I, I it just, it was just wild how I started changing. And, um, I instantly got excited to help other people make those changes. And so um, as I saw God moving in me, I wanted to see him moving in other people. So I started a, uh, a little small group in the rehab and we started seeing people make decisions to, to follow Jesus and getting well. And it was just so awesome. And so instantly my new addiction was more of Jesus. I wanted to get to know him better and I wanted to proclaim how good he was to the world. And so um, over the next several years, uh, believe it or not, I actually got to be on staff for that church a couple years later and got to work for them. And I got some great training and great experience from them. And then I got to be a worship leader at another church and a youth pastor. And so, but I never really felt like, like I enjoy what I was doing and I loved what I was doing, but I never really um, felt like, hey, this is it. Um, until 2018, um, I'd taken a year off ministry and my wife and I were just asking the Lord, you know, what, what should we do? And, um, I did meet my wife, uh, after I got sober, I had my kids after I got sober. My wife is amazing. Uh, she loves the Lord. She loves me so much. She's a great mom. And uh, that's one of the biggest blessings next to Jesus saving me that I've been given. Um, but anyway, so, uh, we just, we just asked God, we said, Hey, what would you have us do? And I had been doing a small group in a local uh, recovery center for about three years. And we saw people doing exactly what I did. They were, you know, giving their lives to God. They were getting baptized. They were getting changed and saved, but something really disheartening happened. We had a guy named Tyler come through our small group. He made a decision to follow God and uh, got baptized. And then he got out and a few months later, he overdosed and died um, on a heroin overdose. And uh, it really hit me hard because, you know, he's a young man. He was 24. He had a three-year-old daughter. And I started asking God, how did we fail him? Like, where did we fail him? Because I really felt like this, this thing called the gospel was supposed to set people free and send them on mission. And what God taught me through that was, um, you know, we're not called to be drive by evangelists. We're called to reach people with the gospel that, but then also to do life with them, 
to grow with them, to show them what it looks like to live on this side of uh, freedom from addiction. And so we started the Hope Project. And um, the Hope Project is basically just a ministry for what we affectionately call the wild ones, the people who are in and out of jail, uh, the drug addicts and alcoholics, and either now or in the past, their families. We've got a component where we tell the whole family to come in and we're going to reach them because we really do believe this is a family disease where the whole family has to get well. Um, these are prostitutes and gangbangers, uh, drug dealers, people right off the streets. We have homeless people come and it's awesome. It is awesome. And so we've been doing this now since November of, of 2018. Um, and we've seen hundreds and hundreds of lives changed as a result of this ministry. And um, all glory to God, because, you know, we just felt like he told us to do it. And we were supposed to be faithful what he called us to do. And he's done the rest. He has shown up so entirely much over the last couple of years. And we're just super grateful to be in a place of where I can use my story for God's glory and to reach people who, again, we call affectionately the wild ones to reach them and see them transformed and changed into something uh, that God can use and God can walk with in such a beautiful way. So we're really excited and, and thankful to be a part of this, this ministry called the hope project. Wow. Wow. What a, what a loaded wild answer. <laughs> Amen. I know that was a long one. <laughs> Uh, we could we could probably call it call it call it um, call it an episode, but we're gonna dive in a little bit more in what makes you who you are today, Chad. What are you inspired by? Oh man, I I think the number one thing that inspires me nothing inspires me more than to see people who are the seemingly unreachable, the people who the world is all but given up on you know, the downtrodden, the people that just need a second chance to see those people captured um, by this beautiful good news of the gospel and transformed into something amazing. And we get to see that all the time in our, in our ministry. We have a girl named Christina came to us about a year ago and um, she came for quite a while. And then one night she broke down at one of our gatherings and she said, I need help. I mean, she was you know, drinking a lot and just living a very hard life. And uh, we were able to get her into detox. And then we showered her um, with our love and just our time uh, for the last about year and a half. And she just celebrated over a year of sobriety. And she was never able to even put a couple days together before she came. So what really gets me excited is to seeing God use the catalyst of the Hope Project to reach those people who are seemingly, remember we said seemingly hopeless um, and seemingly unreachable and seeing that God can do it. God can reach them. He can change them. He can move them. He can remake them into something beautiful. And now Christina is a um, trusted volunteer of our ministry. She does a lot of really great things for us. She got married in the last year or so. She's got a great relationship. And uh, it's just, that sets me on fire. Like that keeps me ticking right there is those kind of stories. Does your life at the moment look like what you envision it to be in your early 20s? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Because uh, when I was you know, 20 to 25, I really didn't think I was going to make it to 35. You know, I, I really had no hope for the future. And um, yeah, I mean, I really honestly didn't think that I was going to be here. I didn't think I was ever going to be able to get sober. And had it not been for um, God, I probably wouldn't have. And that being said, what would you tell your younger self? What would I tell my younger self? Well, you know, I think the number one thing I would tell my younger self is stop running from God. You've been trying to fill your life with these pleasures of the world, these things that are just instant gratification for so long. Just try, just try this, this relationship with Jesus. It can fill you. It can keep you full. Um, it can send you on mission. It can give you joy. Man, you can have joy no matter what your circumstances, no matter what your feelings. Um, you can have joy. You can have peace. You can have freedom. Um, just give just give God a chance. What's the best 
story from your life that has a valuable message. Yeah. Yeah, I think my my favorite story of my life um, is probably mine. And I only say that because um, I've been able to first, like firsthand witness the power of what God uh, can do in people's lives. And, you know, I've got lots of other favorite stories, but man, I got to walk every second of my story um, with God. And I got to, I can see who I used to be and who I am now. And I think it's my favorite story because it's God's story, right? It's his story. It's not mine. Um, he took someone who was dead and made him alive. Like I always tell people, he didn't make, you know, a bad Chad, a good Chad. He made a dead Chad and a live Chad. I believe that I'm literally here talking to you today um, because of his saving power. And, uh, and so, but I've got lots of other favorite stories, but I say mine is, is my favorite because I got to walk it out. I got to see the favor of God throughout the whole thing and see all those times when I could have, I could have been killed. I've, you know, I had guns pulled on me. I, you know, I'd overdosed and had to be Narcan back to life. There were so many things where I could have died. Um, but God said, no, I've got a plan for you. You're going to live through this and I'm going to use you for my glory and for your good. That transition from the previous life to right now, did that Chad have to ask anybody for the permission yeah. to become Chad? He is right now. Yeah, I think so, but in the in the most beautiful way. You know, it wasn't in a way of like, oh, can I do this? If I, you know, if you say no, I'll, you know, I'll I'll be in trouble. It was like, um, God gave me permission to feel my real feelings and not have to put a drink or a drug in my body. He gave me permission um, to, to know my worth, to know that um, he loved me so much that he died for me. He gave me permission to dream big. I have made some, we've had some huge dreams that we've seen God fulfill over the last couple of years that I would have been so scared to even try um, when I was in active addiction, but I think he gave me permission to see my worth and to see that I can, I can do anything he calls me to, because he's going to walk with me through it. And I'm telling you, it's been scary the last couple of years, some of the decisions we've made and, you know, we've, we failed forward a lot and we've done some good things. We've done some bad things, but he's been with me every step of the way through his grace and through his mercy. Um, and he's been faithful to continue to bless me. And so I think the permission he gave me was just permission to um, live in freedom, you know, to be who he called me to be, um, to be the person that I, he always knew I could be, but it was going to take his power to bring out in me, you know? How would you define that freedom? Yeah. Yeah, that freedom, I think, again, I think it's the freedom to be who I was called to be, right? The freedom to um, walk in the fact that um, I am loved and I am accepted by God uh, no matter what I do, no matter what I say. Um, you know, all, I mean, that, that also has parameters. I wanna do everything to glorify him. And, um, but I've got freedom uh, from the, from the penalty of sin in my life, right? I can make mistakes today and not feel like, you know, uh, God's going to be mad at me. He has grace for me has mercy for me. And so I'm not afraid to make mistakes today. I have freedom to, to, to make choices and make decisions that may or may not work. Um, but I know that his grace is sufficient and his power is made great in my weaknesses. And so um, I'm going to continue to have that freedom because of who he is, not because of who I am and because of what he did, not because of what I can do. Chad, what's your favorite book that you've read and why? Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I have a couple of favorite books. Um, my favorite book that I continuously read is the word of God is the Bible. Um, even if you're not a believer in, in God, you can still learn some really, really great lessons uh, from the Bible. But um, it's something that I've, I've developed the habit of. I get to read the Bible every morning. Uh, I get to hear a fresh word from God and I get to grow with him. But I think one of the most influential books in my life, other than um, 
the Bible is a book by Rick Warren called The Purpose Driven Life. And I read that shortly after um, I got sober and put my faith in, in God for my salvation. And it really changed the trajectory of my life. Um, it really started giving me some of those permissions uh, to live the life that I was called to live and to walk in some of that freedom that I had been grant, granted because of that relationship with Jesus. And what's your favorite quote? Yeah, my favorite quote is by Oscar Wilde. Uh, it says, every, sinner has a, every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. I just, it resonates with me so, so much. Um, what that tells me is that the ground really is level at the cross, that every saint has a time where they were a sinner and every sinner has a future where they can be a saint. You know, the, we really are all equal and God can do anything through anyone. He can change anyone anytime he wants. Um, all we've got to do is, is put our faith in him and make him Lord of our lives. Chad, what turns you on? Yeah, man, that's a that's a great question. I'm sure my wife would have a different answer when it comes to our relationship, but <laughs> um, but I but I think what what turns me on is continuing to see God move, continuing to see um, continuing to see God's faithfulness. Like it gets me so excited to see stories like I told you about earlier, like Christina, that just fires me up to continue to reach the wild ones, to reach the ones um, that just need a little extra love, that need someone to share their story or talk their language that has been where they're at. Um, and it gets me fired up to continue to see people who are so far what the world has deemed gone uh, turned into something so beautiful and something so powerful and see them turn from from nightmares into people who can dream and can move and can live and can walk in freedom what is the most important photograph in your life chad yeah um the most important for photograph in my life is um it's a split picture there's one picture um, on the left-hand side, and it's of me uh, severely emaciated, um, strung out on heroin and methamphetamines. Um, and my face says it all. I'm just so broken, so lost. Um, and then the picture on the other side is a picture of me and my beautiful wife and my beautiful kids. And um, we're all smiling. And we've got a beautiful wife and my wife never has to know that Chad and my kids never have to meet that Chad. Um, and I look at that and I see the faithfulness of God. I see what God can do with a broken man or a broken woman and what he can, what he can bless them with, man, I am blessed today, bro. I have got a beautiful family. Um, and it's all because of what God did in me and then did through me. And so um, I keep that close to my desk on those days when uh, I don't feel like continuing on in, in what I'm doing. And I can look at that and say, wow, but look at how faithful you've been, God. I can't imagine how more faithful you're going to be down the road. To anybody who hasn't been able to share that, um, you know, that picture from the past and um, they are still living in, in that moment, perhaps, or they haven't just gotten a chance to come up with a new picture of their next level self, what would you tell them? Yeah, I would tell them, first of all, you are not alone. There are people who are going through and have been through exactly what you're going through. Um, but I will tell you, if you carry on abusing drugs and alcohol or living in high-risk behaviors, you are going to be robbed from this world. You are going to uh, pass away. You're going to end up in an institution um, or you're going to end up in prison. And so <clears throat> I would tell you that there are lots of people that have been where you're at um, and know the way out, right? Have been to hell and know the way to get out of that. And, and so I would tell you to reach out uh, to the Hope Project, our organization. We've got a group of volunteers that would love to walk with you through whatever it is. 
um, that you need help with, whether it be detox, whether it be uh, long-term recovery, uh, whether it be uh, someone just to talk to you on the phone and bounce ideas off of. We've got uh, a whole volunteer staff of people that would love to walk with you through this. The most important thing you need to know, though, is you cannot do this by yourself. You need to work with people that have been where you're at um, and have found the way out. And uh, I just can't stress to you enough that if you carry on in those high-risk behaviors, you're probably going to die. And there are going to be friends and family that are going to mourn your death for the rest of their lives. Um, and so please reach out for help today. Reach out to our organization. We would love uh, to help you uh, get some treatment, get some help, or whatever it is you need. Even if you just need someone to talk with, we would love to be those people for you. What is the best way for people to get in touch with you online? Yeah. So you can go to our website. Our website is www.thehopeproject.cc, and that's C as in cat. Or you can call our ministry phone number. It's 843 284 6526. Um, or you can email us at hello at thehopeproject.cc. Any one of those ways, whichever one you feel comfortable with, we would love for you to reach out. And uh, we are a totally free service and it is our great honor uh, to walk with people who are struggling and their families. We also, if there are families that are listening that are um, struggling with someone who is addicted, we've also got help for you. So uh, please reach out. Thank you for being on the show, Chad. Thank you for sharing your story and what makes you who you are today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Everybody in the audience, we'll see you next time.